I am Alex Brickoff, and I will be hosting tonight's virtual edition of the East Side Clinic. And uh, our clinic tonight is sponsored, as always, by the fourth division of the PNR, the Pacific Northwest region of the NMRA, the National Model Railroad Association. Tonight, uh, we'll be hearing from Rich Blake, and he will be talking about kit bashing locomotives for realism and operation. Uh, Rich will be describing some of his techniques for modifying and detailing locomotives to enhance their operation and their appearance. Uh, Rich is an avid modeler. He's also involved with several modular groups, among those being the Pacific Northwest ON30 modular group and models logging and short line themed modules based on narrow gauge prototypes in southwestern Washington. So having said that, let me introduce Rich Blake. I'm the clinician chair of the uh, Whidbey Clinic and I do a lot of ON30 modeling. I switched to ON30 about 12, 13 years ago from HO. I got influence from my dad. My dad was a HO scale modeler. So he's the guy that got me started back in the early 70s and I've never never quite got away from it, the interest level, but I've never really had a layout either. So that's why I do modules. I spent 30 years in the Navy. so during that time really didn't have the space or time to do any kind of real serious modeling. So built a lot of dioramas and, you know, a couple of structures here and there and stuff. Never really got into it until I actually retired from the military. So now I have six modules that I travel around with the ON30 modular group. It's a continuous effort, continuous work in progress, and it's been a lot of fun. The clinic tonight is uh, locomotive mods and kit bashing. It's kit bashing and, um, Locomotive modifications is something that uh, some folks kind of have a hard time with in that, you know, you spend several hundred dollars on a locomotive and, uh, you know, you pull it out of the box. And today's locomotives, especially the die cast ones like these Bachman ones and a lot of other companies are doing really nice die cast and plastic locomotives. And they look great. You know, you pull them out of the box and they, they do look pretty good. But for myself, I wanted something unique, something different, and try to follow some type of prototype. And um, I did want to get some NMRA uh, AP points for a locomotive. You know, I have several of these Bachman locomotives. Um, I just chose a couple of them to get into some super de detailing projects and uh, get some merit awards for those locomotives. A lot of it is practicing painting and weathering. You know, this is, this is one of my first efforts really completely disassembling a locomotive and going through and doing a lot of uh, modifications to it and getting really into the weathering and painting and detailing stuff. The other objective was um, getting it to run reliably. I don't know how many folks have experienced issues with out-of-the-box locomotives where it looks great, you put it on the track, it runs great for about 10 minutes as you're breaking it in and then it starts having issues or maybe it's 10 weeks or 10 months and then it starts having issues, whatever. Um, these Bachman ON30 locomotives were notorious for um, having gearbox and running gear issues so much so that um, Bachman, the company, they actually gave a bunch of gear sets away for free to anybody who owned a loc. All you had to do is provide them with a list of locomotives you had and they would send you a free set of gears for them to kind of correct the problem. A lot of stuff was technically fixed under warranty, but you had to do all the work yourself. So I got to learn how the guts of the locomotive work because I did have to replace a lot of gears and stuff. Um, the other thing was uh, getting the sounds and the lights correct, using the DCC decoders, getting it synchronized and just getting the thing to run realistically. Cause there's a lot of features with the decoders that are there, but are underutilized. The, the decoders are very complex and they have a lot of um, electrical features to sense the, you know, the current demands of the motor or to adjust how it sounds or how it, how it moves and stuff like that. And there's a lot of advantages to be taken in exploring those features and making your locomotives run really well. I really didn't have a plan at the beginning. Um, I just knew that I wanted some kind of crusty looking logging locomotive to work on my modules. And the first set of modules I built was based on a logging theme. Got a Climax locomotive, got a logging themed set of modules, but I, I really didn't have a prototype to emulate. 
So I kind of searched around for that. And what I ended up with is down in the southwest corner of Washington, there's a, there was a lot of spruce lumber down there. And I actually did a clinic recently on the spruce lumber division that the Army had uh, ran to extract spruce out of the northwest to build aircraft. That's actually on our 4D um, YouTube channel. There was one narrow gauge railroad that they had built down there. And I don't know why it was narrow gauge, but out of all these standard gauge railroads that they had down there, there was one narrow gauge one. And that was the Bay. Well, it became the Bay Logging Company. It was just one, it was one of the divisions of the Spruce Railroads. And then that line got sold off and it was bought by the Bay Logging Company. And they had one Climax locomotive and about five miles of track or so. And they dumped logs into, into a Willapa Bay. So that became my prototype. I was like, hey, I got a location. It's narrow gauge. It's not 30 inch gauge, it's 36 inch gauge, but it's close enough. And they have they had an old Climax locomotive. And so I was like, this is gonna be my, my proto fictional uh, theme that I'm gonna base my a lot of my projects on. And it, it's been working for me ever since. So all of my modules are based on something around this area down here in Southwest Washington. You know, they had the El Waco Railway Navigation Company, which was on the Long Beach Peninsula down there. That's That was 36 inch gauge. And then the, the Bay Lumber Company was 36 inch gauge. A lot of the little, little railroads that were down uh, off the Columbia River, the mouth of the Columbia that built the dikes and stuff, all that kind of stuff down there. Those are all narrow gauge uh, railroads as well. So there's plenty of narrow gauge stuff that I could use for proto fictional modeling. So when I started to think about what I was going to do with the project, of course, the locomotive coming out of the box was too new. I mean, it's a nice looking locomotive, but it was way too nice. My, you know, my theme was this railroad existed after you know, World War One after the big boom of the 1920s, and now we're starting to get into the Depression era, where there's a lot of second and third hand equipment being used, and they're just, you know, trying to extract all they can out of what's left in the woods that's worth anything to the market. You know, they're, it's not brand new equipment. But when I look at the, the historical picture of the actual Bay Lumber Company, locomotive that they had. It looked pretty run down. It didn't even have a headlight on it, you know, so there's no generator. They may have been still using Lincoln pin couplers. I don't know that they got Lincoln pin in the front. Um, so it was kind of a little bit too run down for me, I think, very dilapidated. So I needed to find something kind of in between. So I searched around the internet and I found this is, um, yeah, Elk River uh, Lumber Company. I think that's out of somewhere back east. But it's a nice locomotive that has lots of characters, got the steel cab, like the locomotive that, uh, you know, the one that I'm working off of has the same steel steel type cab. But there's a lot of uh, design cues on here that sparked my interest. Like on the, you know, on the tender in the back, there's the sandboxes. Well, the, the Bachman model doesn't have those on there. Also, the uh, reverse light is on top of the cab in the back, which I, I thought was kind of cool instead of having it in the tender, like the, uh, the stock one, there's the light on the back of the stock one. And then like they got this water hose wrapped around um, sand dome up there. That's kind of a cool feature. So they're using that to pump water for a, a, off of a steam pump. Over here on this other side, you got a bunch of stuff on the front of the locomotive, a bucket of grease, looks like a fuel can or something, you know, and just junk laying around on that pilot in the front. So I use those, you know, as ideas, and then they either have the, the brake compressor is blowing off steam over here, or there maybe there's a steam pump on this side. So I ended up putting a steam pump on my locomotive on the side over here as part of that idea. And then, you know, completely different stack than the stock locomotive comes with. You know, this is an oil stack. My locomotive is going to be wood fired, so I needed some kind of spark arrestor, and this is a nice looking example here. All right, so this is uh, stages of <clears throat> what I came up with to get going on this project. So first thing that I needed to do was figure out what extra parts that I needed and get those things on order or dig through my box of stuff and see what I had. Some of the parts that I used were things that I just made out of whatever was laying around, plastic, brass. I use um, the tin off of, off of wine bottles 
you know, that stuff comes in pretty handy, that, that foil, that thick foil. So I just use a lot of stuff that I just had laying around, but I did uh, purchase uh, several castings that I could use for this and other projects. Um, the other part was disassembly. Parts organization, I have what's called a chop shop segment where you got to basically reconfigure things, making sure that the decoder and speaker installs okay. And, you know, any lights and wiring modifications, mechanical and electrical stuff, you know, make sure that's all squared away before we start really painting, things like that. I replaced the couplers that Bachman locomotives come with these plastic couplers. I put KDs on there. So start, you know, doing the painting from the chassis out, doing things in stages with painting and stuff after it's all disassembled. Uh, I needed an engineer and a fireman. So I had to find those and, and paint those guys up and stick them in there. And then the reassembly stage, which is kind of the crucial stage, right? Once you get it back together, you really don't want to take it apart again. So, you know, put it back together carefully and correctly. Uh, and then the accessories detailing a lot of doodads around the locomotive that I had to do. Like decals, I used um, dry transfer lettering and then final paint and detail. And then running in the locomotive and then doing all of the uh, programming and stuff with JMRI. All right, so on the disassembly stage, now this is applies to a die cast Bachman model, which I think most of them are typically the same. They provide on their website illustrated parts breakdown of all of their locomotives. So you can download a PDF file of the breakout of all the parts for a locomotive and have those as a reference as you're tearing things apart. A lot of the little doodads and parts and things, they're just kind of glued on there. So if you got a number 11 exacto blade or something, you know, some little dental picks or whatever, you can pop things off fairly easily without breaking things. And this picture here shows one of the stacks I was experimenting with. I actually ended up using that. I got a whistle casting over there, some other doodads, nuts and bolts and re-railers in that bag over there. Now for a brass locomotive, completely different story. Brass locomotives don't really come apart like this, but most of the time when you purchase a brass locomotive, it's already super detailed. So you really shouldn't have to do a whole lot other than just paint it. But some you know, older brass locomotives may have details that are in the wrong place or they need to be repaired because of age or whatever. And that's a, that's a whole different clinic that I'm not even gonna try to cover here. That's all about soldering and stuff like that so but this some of the techniques i do in here though they would apply to a diesel locomotive plastic models plastic body i mean weathering is weathering you know just everybody's got their own method so i'm just going to show you how i do mine all right so in the chop shop on the right side here what i did before i committed to actually chopping anything is um I kind of set the boiler and the cab up with a side shot here and took some pictures of it. And then I got into Photoshop with some of the piece parts that I had. And I used Photoshop to erase things off the existing picture. And then I used Photoshop with my other piece parts and move stuff around to see what it looked like. Once I got to the final result that I wanted, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to chop off the existing stock stack so I can move it so I can put the generator behind the stack instead of in front of the stack. You know, a couple other things I had to move around. And on the left there, you can see the smoke box has been modified to chop the, uh, the stock stack off of there. And then this is my cast uh, stack mount for the stack that I was gonna use uh, installed in the new location. And I'm just using a Dremel tool for a lot of this stuff. Nothing special, Dremel tool and a file, old school tools. So the back of the uh, tender has a die cast step right here for the light assembly. So I needed to get rid of that because I was gonna put the light on top of the back of the cab. So I use, I have a flex, a flex Dremel tool with on a flex cord thing. And I just use a milling bit to gently go back and forth and keep taking material off of that step until it was the same profile as the back of the tender. And then I filled that in with, I had filled part of this in with a piece of plastic and then blended all this in with, with putty. I just use a Tamiya type uh, model putty, nothing special. And then there's the light assembly that's been cannibalized out of that tender. 
And then the next thing here, this is uh, relocating the rear light. So I'm gonna put it on top of the back of the tender here, but I wanted it to actually operate. So I needed to wire it. So I ran, uh, drilled a couple holes in the back of the, the cab there. And this is, the cab is die cast also. So um, I'm drilling through metal here and then ran the wires down, made a gap in the, uh, the back aft bulkhead there and then ran the wires down the corner of the cab down to the bottom where I could connect a um, little two pin connector. So if I ever wanna take it apart again, I could just disconnect the connector and I can pull the cab off of there without having to desolder any wires and stuff. And I, and I put a picture up here where I got the, the little connector is TCS. I think they make decoders and stuff like that. All right, so the next big thing, you go back and look at the the original tender, the back of it's just flat. There's nothing on the back of it. So I had to come up with a plan of attack for my tender because it need, I needed um, these sandboxes back there. I wanted a ladder or some type of ladder to get up and down because it, it's also gonna be a wood fired locomotive. So it's gonna need you know, some fencing back there to hold piles of wood. So to make my wood fencing, I just used strips of brass and super glued plastic onto the brass. And I'm, I'm, this is just a piece of pink foam. I'm using stick pens to hold everything in place while the glue dries. And I use this flat foam and stick pens for a lot of assembly stuff. So I'll, I'll put like a drawing of a frame structure for buildings or whatever on the surface of the foam. Then I'll put a piece of wax paper over the top of it. And then I'll start laying my wood down on whatever my pattern is and stick it down with the, with the pens and glue stuff together that way and it, it works great so so it's you know it's the typical thick foam you can get from the hardware store it, it's fairly it's not perfectly flat but it's flat enough yeah, and it works pretty good so i use it for a lot of construction stuff so here's the fence in place and then once it's a kind of first coat of uh, flat black on it just to see what it looked like you know blends in pretty good i had to make a uh, a panel to cover the top of the tender up out of, out of uh, styrene that went in there. And then on the back, this is just some precision scale ladder rungs that I stuck on there for the ladder. Cause I needed to access the back of the tender, you know, to dump wood in there a lot. So I needed a ladder back there. So to make the sandboxes, stage one was cutting two pieces of aluminum tubing, gluing those together and then filling in the gap with putty to make it look like it's a oval container. So it's just two tubes and then there's a gap filling in and then styrene to make the top and the bottom. The hinge like over here is the um, foil from a wine bottle. And then I just use a pin to make, you know, fake rivets there. It's a little piece of brass wire for the handle to lift the box up to put sand in it. The bottom here, these are um, leftover pieces of brass from a brass sprue that I kind of filed to make them look like the spigots that would be that would be on the bottom to disperse the sand. The one thing that I forgot to do was drill those out so I could put a tube to go down to the wheels. So it, it's, it's still like that. It's something I need to fix in the future. So then the straps on there, that's just the wine bottle aluminum foil shaped to the form and then added a couple couple of rivet looking indentations on there glued all that stuff together and is ready to go. All right, so those are the basic <laughs> modifications. You can see the stack is on there. I haven't mounted some of the other accessories that go on the top. There's, you know, there's a grab rail that goes up there. There's a bunch of piping, all the stuff that feeds the, the, the steam dome. All that stuff's not installed yet. That's all still laying in the box. So I wanted to get the initial stage of painting base layer down. So get the locomotive body and the, um, the smoke box done. I left the um, the gearbox assembly in on the cylinders. I left all that intact and I, I taped all that stuff off as I was doing my painting. So there was a lot of masking down here that I did. And I also masked off the part of the firebox that would be more of a metallic color than the than the boiler. So there was, there was a bit of masking involved for different things. They're just This is just, you know, the left upper left corner. This is just basic masking and you know, I had to mask off the whole boiler in order to do the smoke box and then the the uh, builder's plate on the side of the smoke box I, I masked that off too 
Then on the right here, you can see, you know, what those sandboxes look like as they're, uh, now that they're painted, they look like they're part of the, the locomotive now. Um, I had to mask off the lens on the light. That was fun making that little mask. So I just use ta uh, Tamiya acrylics. I like Tamiya paint. I like Tamiya thinner. It works really well on the airbrush. Use the airbrush a lot. And if I'm not using the airbrush and I'm like just primering things, I usually use the Tamiya primer. I've tried automotive stuff. I've tried Krylon. I've tried some of the other, you know, like paints you can buy at Walmart or whatever. And they're generally too thick for detail type stuff like this. If you're just doing like buildings or background stuff or whatever, just painting a bunch of things the same color than those, those rattle cans you get at the box store, those are fine. But for more high detail stuff, you wanna use a, a good hobby paint. The smoke box gunmetal, that's, uh, that's a Tamiya color also. And you can actually buff that out a little bit if you want to after it's dry. One of the things, I just, you saw this little picture in the corner. It, it's not nothing about the airbrushes. It's the, this is just a sidebar about some of the tips and techniques that I've learned over the years. If I have something new or something I've done that requires thought in the future or trying to remember how to do something, I just use recipe cards and write down all the stuff that I did, you know, how, what the paint mixtures are, um, you know, a sequence of how to do stuff, things like that. And trying, instead of trying to save it on the computer, or, I just have all this stuff sitting in a box and I just look at it. It's, it's easier, it's way easier to thumb through for me than it is for, you know, looking at a computer, trying to find techniques and stuff. And if I spill paint on it, it ain't no big deal. I didn't ruin anything. Whereas if I spill paint on my computer, that's, that's a bad day. After the base coat is done and dried for at least a day or two, I'll get going on my initial weathering. And I like to use oil paints for weathering on locomotives and um, cars because they're, they're really easy to work with and you can have all kinds of different effects. What I do with the oils is I just put a uh, index card, tape it to the workbench and put a little dab of the oil on the card because the oil paints are going to seep a little bit. So the card kind of soaks up some of that oil as well. And I use uh, odorless turpentine in a little cup and I can adjust, you know, how thick it is. It's definitely a practiced technique. You don't want to like the first time you ever use the oils on something on your, one of your favorite, you know, or a contest model you're trying to build or something like that. You want to practice this on other things you don't care about before you commit to doing something like a locomotive. Try it out on different things and see what kind of effects that you can achieve. So what I'm doing here with, with this top of the cab is I'm just putting little dabs with a toothpick of the oil paint on top of the cab of different, so I got different rust colors and grays and, and kind of grimy black colors. And then I'll take that turpentine, just to wash a turpentine and blend all that stuff in. So it looks like, you know, kind of a dirty streaky top of a cab, like it should. And it all blends in very nice. You know, you can add more, the, the more turpentine you add, the more kind of dull it gets and it dries very, very flat you know, which is desirable on this kind of project. And then, so <clears throat> apply the same technique all over the locomotive in the areas that, that need it. Experimented with a little bit of a rust streak right here on the windowsill coming down. That was a, uh, I, I would call myself, it's kind of a risky venture. I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is gonna do. Let me try it. And I think it came out okay. Don't want I didn't wanna get too carried away because this is a working locomotive that they would kind of take care of. It just, maybe it's been in the woods for three or four days and they haven't had a chance to wash it or it's been raining the whole time. And it, you know, it just now the sun came out and now you have all this dried, dirty water all over the locomotive. And of course the dry transfers, I applied those before I started doing any of this. Okay, so after a lot of that painting was done, I didn't do everything like do, like a lot of folks will do, uh, you know, they do their initial painting and then they do their washes and then they start doing the chalks. You know, that's kind of the typical steps for weathering. I stayed away from the chalks because I had a lot of accessories I had to reinstall back on the locomotive. So there was a lot of uh, detail work that had to be done and assembled before I could commit to doing any of the, the last stage of weathering. 
So here's a brass whistle I had stuck on the, uh, the main steam pipe assembly that goes to the steam dome. I got some uh, plumbing here. These fittings here are AN fittings that I had left over from some automotive 124 scale plastic car model projects. I'm sure you can find this, these kind of castings in the railroad community. I just, I don't know where. And so I built this, uh, this is a cast steam pump and I had to put some, uh, some wire in there for the, uh, the cylinders because that, that wasn't part of the casting. So I just had to add that and then started adding, you know, different plumbing pieces that connect to the boiler. And then some local accessories. See, these are just little pieces of foam with masking tape, sticky side up, stick those little guys on there and paint away. You know, I'm using paints, I'm using chalks and stuff, and I use oils on these as well to blend things in and do washes and stuff. The, uh, the white metal castings are, are cool because you can scrape away the paint to reveal the white metal to make it look like it's a little bit more worn than it actually is. So I like to do that kind of, that kind of stuff. And then I got a couple of dudes, dude one, dude two, to wrap a solder around to make, make my water hose that I was going to install on top of the, on the, around the sand dome. So that was preformed, ready to go on. All I had to do was paint it. And then there's dudes installed <clears throat> in the cab. And I just use for installing my uh, crew, I usually just use white glue on their feet so I can remove them pretty easily. Sometimes they fall over at a show because they do a lot of shows and, you know, locomotives get a lot of work. So um, sometimes dudes will fall, fall over. I, I just re-glue them. And then this, this shows a typical Bachman type electronics package where you have a board for your lights and there's some capacitors and stuff on there for the motor. There's a eight pin uh, NMRA DCC plug. And then this top board is a, a sound board that uh, Bachman either supplies with your locomotives or you can buy afterwards. And it's based on a uh, did, uh, Soundtracks Tsunami uh, decoder. So this Climax actually came with sound in it already. So th I didn't really have to do anything. I just, you know, put the tender on it. But now that I've experienced the Tsunami 2, I'm going to replace this decoder with a Tsunami 2 because the Tsunami 2s are awesome. All right, here's some more pictures of some of the accessories getting installed. I mean, these are just typical castings, a little piece of chain. This is a brass accessory toolbox uh, glued in place there. It still has the plastic coupler on her that needs to be replaced. Hand painted the the number plate. That was not fun. And that's that's using enamel paint, enamel gold paint, because you, you need to use a solvent paint for those kind of colors because any other acrylic paints don't usually work too well with most most high metallic type paint. And then over here on the right, got some of the uh, steam plumbing installed. I used started to apply some of the chalks this is actually pigments that are made for military models. I use those a lot more than the chalk stuff or the pan pastels or whatever you call them. I typically use the pigments a lot because I like the way that you can, I mean, you can mix thinner into it and make a wash out of it, or you can use it dry. You can use it with a stipple brush. You can, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. And then this pull cord for the bell, and this is a Grantline bell here also, by the way. The pull cord is a single strand out of a multi-strand piece of 20 gauge wire. So I just took the insulation off the wire and pulled one strand out of it. And then that's what I use for the pull cord. It, typically these locomotives come with a piece of thread right here that's about four inches thick in scale and it doesn't look too well. So I ripped those off of there and put a piece of wire on there to make it look a little bit more scale. And here's some more detail shots. So I got the uh, the generators installed now, and it was actually lowered quite a bit from the original mount. Plumbing installed, grab rails. Um, I got my, my steam pump installed. I put water hose around the sandbox there with, with one of those AN fittings on there as a, a coupling. And then a couple more junk items in the front, got a jack there and some other stuff. So it's starting to come together. Got the stack on there. It's got a homemade um, scratch-built spark arrestor. So it's just a piece of styrene strip with some really fine mesh screen I got at a hobby shop when those still existed. I still have a lot of that screen, so I'm keeping it. 
And this just over here on the left is just, this is the MIG pigments. And then this is um, making the wood load. This is rhododendron branches that were cut into rounds. And then I use a, a, a chisel with a hammer to split the wood. A little bit easier than using a ax in real life, but it takes just as much time. And then on, on the right over here, this is a picture of a pencil and it's a, um, I think it's an HB pencil. So it's soft lead. I use the, the pencil to kind of highlight corners, raised, raised areas on top of metallic objects to give it a little bit more sheen. It's a pretty effective use of, of graphite to uh, enhance the appearance of a lot of these objects and make the rivets pop out or make the corners kind of pop out on different details on it, what's normally just a completely flat black locomotive. And then this is a picture from the back with some of the uh, pigment uh, weathering applied. I uh, use a stipple brush a lot for that. The stipple brush, just basically an old brush with all the bristles cut off where they're really super short and you can just kind of stab at the surface with it and you know, dab different powders on there and create different effects. And then this just shows the uh, evolution of where it started. And then the second picture, number seven, it's the same locomotive, but this was after I had just, all I did was do some India ink wash on the body kind of, and did a little bit of uh, chalk weathering just so that I could feel confident putting it on the layout that I was like, hey, I got a weathered locomotive. I washed all that stuff off with alcohol before I started the final project here. And this is just a view of it on the track, another view. So it blends in with the scenery pretty well. It blends in with all my stuff because everything I have is weathered in some form. It's not overly weathered, but it's definitely stuff that's used, you know, buildings the same way. Everything's got a little bit of um, use on it. So this is my proto-fictional, this is my original inspiration was that Bay Lumber Company locomotive. So I set up my finished locomotive with kind of a similar scene and did some Photoshop, you know, added some grain to the picture. So that was a fun, fun photo shoot day. There's a lot of times when I'm at shows, I'll have this load of logs on a train and people will be like, man, those logs are way too big. And then I just show them this picture of the actual prototype with logs that big. So they're like, oh, okay, I guess he really did have logs that big. All right, this is a different locomotive. This is the Deuce. It's my two truck, two cylinder Shea. This was the first Owen 30 locomotive that I that I purchased. This is the locomotive that pulled me away from HO scale. This one, not nearly as modified as that Climax, but I use a lot of the same techniques with some of the oil weathering and then the, uh, the pigment application of the, the powders. And you notice I kept the cylinders and all that running gear really clean. I don't want to get any of that weathering stuff on the running gear. And it's going to be loaded up with grease and lubricant anyway. Not on this locomotive, but in real life, it would have had, you know, lots of grease and stuff on it. So that stuff should be fairly clean. This locomotive, though, I did something on here that I wish I would have did with the Climax. And that was I found this glazing kit for the cab that had scale looking windows that you could open and close and stuff and stick in here. And I thought it really added a lot, a lot of character to the locomotive. And so I go back and look at my Climax. If I did this again, I would mill all this stuff out and put some scratch built windows and stuff in there. Maybe, maybe have a door that's kind of halfway open or something like that. And it's a black and white old school picture. This is actually at a show. All right, so I guess it's a good time for any questions on weathering stuff or just the, the process here. Just out of curiosity, what kind of airbrush do you use? Right now I'm using an Awada dual action airbrush. I have a few of them. So this you got a single action up here, typical Badger. I've used that a lot, but what I found over time is that the dual action works better for acrylic paint because sometimes acrylic paint's a little bit thicker and it doesn't flow as well. So the dual action gives you the ability to, to adjust the amount of flow and pressure, you know, with your finger instead of having to adjust the, the needle positioning on a single action. So I prefer the, the dual action. And also what I found too is that acrylic paint clogs up the nozzle on your airbrush a lot faster than other paints. 
So what I've done is I've relegated my the single action badger to nothing but solvent paints. So I only paint lacquer and enamel through this brush and I keep that one separate from the acrylic stuff. Different airbrushes for different type paints because you don't want to mix acrylic and lacquer or e uh, enamel paint in the same brush because you'll be cleaning it forever. And it's yeah, it's just bad. So my suggestion is if you're going to mix type paints, have a different airbrush for each type paint, which should only be two, really. So one of the things with these Bachman, like I said before, they have gear issues or they have the potential to have gear issues. So one of the things I had to do is uh, completely disassemble the locomotive and replace some of the gears in it. And this is just a factor with a lot of your die cast steam locomotives, especially, you know, depending on the complexity of the locomotive, uh, you know, articulated some have sometimes have issues. The geared locomotives will definitely have issues because there's so much going on. Even if it's brand new out of the box, you can't trust it. It just all depends on how it was assembled that day. You know, it could have been on a Friday. So somebody didn't tighten up the screw or didn't put the collar on all the way or, you know, the gear's not in the exact right position. So some of these gears, I had to actually move the gear on the shaft to get the lash on the, uh, you know, the drive here to operate smoothly. You can't just jam grease in there and expect it to work because it's just plastic gears anyway. So grease really doesn't do anything, it just collects dirt. I, so I had to fiddle around with this to make it run smooth. And a lot of these, you know, the, especially these geared locomotives, you can take the trucks off and you know disconnect everything from the from the drive motor and the drive box and you can just roll the thing on the ground on you know on a piece of track or on your bench and just see how freely that it moves back and forth and you can tell if there's any binding in any of the gears pretty quickly with your finger just on top of it just very lightly rolling it back and forth and if you feel any any resistance or any crunchiness or anything like that then you're going to have to investigate what's going on there and you know you definitely want to do that before you commit to weathering and detailing and all the other stuff because you don't want to take this apart again. So I usually do this kind of work when the loco is new out of the box. This is a picture of the one of the Shea type locomotives. These now these Bachman Shays in particular, they use two little pieces of wire that are bent up at a 180 degree angle here. And then those go down to these little wipers on the wheels. And the wipers are very small little wires. And these little wires are just little small copper wires. And that bend right there makes contact with this plate over here on the bolster. And that plate right there is has two wires soldered to it. Those are your pickup wires. This is notoriously unreliable on this particular locomotive. So what I did on mine is like on this picture on the right is put more robust wipers on it. I actually used phosphorus bronze guitar string that I had left over from my guitar, good conductor. So I fabricated some wipers instead of trying to rely on this contact point here is soldered in wire, actual hard wire, and then soldered that wire to the board. So you have a hard mount you know, wiring going directly to the wheels instead of this little funky. So this is something that you have to think about too, especially if you're never going to go to battery power. And if I started over again, I would go directly to battery power, but it's too late now. So I got to stick with maintaining good electrical contact. And the more contact you can get, the better. So I had to do some re-gearing on the Shea trucks in particular. These pinion gears, you know, the, the Shea gearbox but the motor drives a crankshaft. The crankshaft turns the, the line shafts and the line shafts turn these pinions and they're driving the wheels. So that's where your drive comes from. A lot of your brass locomotives, they cheat. They'll use a gear box and you know, gear box that drives a worm gear in the middle here somewhere. And it just has fake mechanism on the outside. This is actually driving the wheels the way a Shea does, the way that the Bachman is built which is pretty cool. But at the same time, these gears, the stock gears are plastic. 
I mean, uh, some type of soft Delrin material or something. And if they've gone through a lot of heat cycles, which typically happens when they're sitting inside a container on a ship traveling across the ocean from China, they'll crack. And I had a brand new shade that I pulled out of the box and it had crack gears on it. I didn't never, never even put it on the track once and it already had crack gears just because of temperature differences. And that's one of the reasons why Bachman sent free gear sets to everybody because they knew that was a big issue. So instead of using those gears that I acquired from Bachman, I just went with the Northwest Shortline gear set, which they make specifically for this Shea. And so what you got to do here is you got to replace the plastic gears with the metal gears and without bending the shaft. So this little container over here is all my little adapter tools and doodads I use in a vise to push those gears on there without bending the shaft. Proceed with caution, that's all I can tell you. I also had to remotor my Shea. It's just an example of a motor, aftermarket motor you can get from Northwest Short Line. It, it works great. Once it was installed, my Shea was like, is this a whole different beast? Because I had two of them. The, the first one is the one that I detailed and its gears were fine for the first year or so, and then they cracked. And uh, it just started running terribly. And so I had to replace replace those pinions with the with the metal ones. And now it's it's awesome. The thing runs great. All right, so decoders. So my Shea is a good example of a, a home brewed decoder install. The, this picture on the bottom is from the Climax. That's the uh, soundboard on the stock uh, Bachman electronics board there with the eight pin DCC <clears throat> NMRA pin connector. But the one on the right here, that's a tsunami decoder with a big fat capacitor in there, uh, biggest than one I could fit. There's still a uh, electronics board inside of here just for the lights and stuff. It's kind of oversized. I could probably got rid of that and just used uh, hardwired diodes and things like that uh, and resistors, but um, I left it. When I did that though, I ran kind of ran a real estate really quick. So the one nice thing about having a, this as a wood fired locomotive is that the um, plastic wood load was hollow. So I'd stick the decoder, the decoder's actually inside the wood load uh, on this locomotive. And then I put some real, I just glued real pieces of wood on top of it to make it look less like plastic and more like a real wood load. The effect is okay. And the decoder is in a nice spot where it doesn't get too hot. That's one thing about decoders, you gotta be careful where you put them because they don't really have very good a very good heat sink on them. And uh, if you put them in a too tight of a location, they'll get hot. Once they start getting hot, they start doing weird things. And you know, the worst thing that happens is you just smoke check it. So you don't wanna do that. I tried to find the biggest speaker I could fit in there and still get everything else in there. And then made sure that there was an enclosure on that speaker on the back side of it. That gives it a lot better uh, sound profile. So once the decoder's installed, then um, I use JMRI exclusively. This picture on the left is not my setup. I do have a Digitrack Zephyr on my that I use at home for my modules. And I tried to program a locomotive with that one time, and that was all it took, one time. It's like, I'm not doing that ever again. So I went to JMRI, and I've never tried to program with anything else since then. So if you're not doing JMRI, please do, because it'll save you a lot of time and headache. And it's not really that hard to set up. I use a uh, Sprog interface for the computer. I also have a PR3 Digitrax interface that works fine, but it's kind of a legacy device. The Sprog is uh, quite a bit newer and uh, it works a little bit better, I think. It's just easier to use, I guess. But I do have a programming track on an eight foot shelf. And when I want to use it, I just, clamp it to the workbench, you know, I'll program something and then I'll just run it, go back and change some settings and then run it again, and, you know, do whatever it's like and just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and, and I have to worry about flipping too many switches or working around scenery or whatever and stuff like that. And then when you are doing any type of tuning, definitely keep good notes. That's the main thing. And what I've tried to do myself you know, I have all steam roster. I have some small diesel critters, which are different, but you know, all my steam locomotives, I try to make them run very similar as far as their momentum, their braking, you know, all the function keys are set up the same way. So there's no confusion. The momentum and braking settings are, are very similar so that it's not too much different going from one locomotive to another. So I do use a lot of momentum and I do use a lot of braking momentum 
So you pretty much have to use the brake key if you want to stop. You can't just sit there and twist the throttle back and forth and expect a locomotive to respond to it. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to keep moving. So um, you got you have to use the brake, and, that, and that's the way I like to operate them because it's way more realistic. But a lot of people don't like that. So whatever your preference is, but like the point of here is just make sure you have a standard and you stick with it. Keep good documentation. A couple of these locomotives, it took me a, a good part of a week you know, about an hour a day goofing around with settings and stuff to get it running exactly the way that I wanted it to. And had I not wrote everything down, it would have, it would have taken me longer to figure it out. And here's some of the sources for um, accessories that I like to go to. Keith Wiseman, he's got a lot of fine detail items on the website, H -O, all scales, H-O-S-O -O scale. Uh, Sierra West, he's still making stuff, a lot of detail casting, a little bit more expensive for that stuff, but it's very, very high quality. And especially the, um, he's got the Charles Brommer castings. He made all kinds of logging castings back in the day before he passed away. And he has all the um, the masters for that. So the Sierra West. Narrow Gauge Modeling Company, that's a um, website ran company that has a lot of interesting doodads. I'll just call them doodads. You know, it's kind of like a mom and pop internet store, I guess you'd call it. But it's it's narrow gauge modeling, but there's a lot of stuff that they have that apply to any any type of modeling. You know, so you got figures, you got scenery, a lot of lot of little scenery detail items. It's a very interesting website. This was mainly about Bachman trains. So you know Bachman still makes a lot of locomotives and stuff. I like to get my inspiration from narrow gauge and short line gazette. And I also like to use my imagination. And if you don't have imagination, you can use the internet. I think that was the last slide. Okay, Rich. Well, thank you very much, Rich. That was an outstanding clinic. Really enjoyed it. Would you say something about epoxying the shaft on the Bachman locomotives that slip? Oh, yeah. These Climaxes, and I'm sure the HO one's the same way. So you got a gearbox right here. You know, on each side of the gearbox, forward and aft, there's a little yoke fitting here. It's a U-joint, but it, it uses a yoke with a collar. And that yoke piece that fits on the shaft right here, sometimes that will crack. And what ends up happening is the gearbox will run fine, but to drive from the shaft through the yoke to the line shaft to the gear assembly in the, in the trucks, you lose a lot of torque right here because the shaft is spinning faster than the trucks are moving. The yoke fitting is slipping. So I've had that happen several times with this Climax in particular. So what I had to do, take the truck off so you can get access in here without the line shaft in the way. Basically what I did is I go in with a pair of hemostats or something, clamping the, uh, the fitting on the shaft and just using epoxy to glue it in place. So that whenever the gearbox shaft is spinning, it's driving the wheels, it's not slipping. If you have any of these climaxes and they start doing weird stuff like, you know, hopping on the track or it seems like you should be going a lot faster than you're actually going, it's probably because these shafts are slipping down here on the gearbox output. These Bachman products are great. You know, they, the die casting is awesome. They did a great job with that. It's just sometimes the mechanicals are weren't... The materials that they use for the gears and stuff like that were just not cured the right way or something like that so that they're susceptible to temperature environmental changes and they get brittle and they'll crack or whatever. So that's just the biggest drawback from, from these geared Bachman locomotives. And how did you make your contact to the motor? Did you just attach wires right to those screws there in the middle or, or what yeah. did you do? Yeah. So I, I tend to, I tend to wire you know, into a hook shape. And then I just hooked it under the screw and tightened it all down. From the truck where the wire connection is to the wipers, there's a wire going to this location that's soldered. Yeah, I just soldered to that solder pad that's already there. You know, and it gave myself enough enough wires where I could pull the truck off. But if I really want to pull a truck completely off, I have to desolder it. But the objective was to do that one time and never have to mess with it again. <laughs> Rich, I would like to uh, thank you again very much for presenting your clinic tonight at the Eastside Get Together. Yep, thank you.